But when the Nazis seized power through the Enabling Act of 1933 after the election, they are pretty anti-Berlin and Berliners. The Berlins only voted about 30% roughly of Berlin votes in favour of Hitler in the 1933 election, which Hitler never forgives them for. Hello and welcome to the Aspects of History podcast. My name is Oliver Webb Carter and I'm the editor and your host. 2023 is the 750th birthday of that great city of Berlin. And so to commemorate it, we have Barney White Spunner, author of A History of the City, joining me to discuss it. Barney is a historian and former senior army officer who was stationed in the city in the 80s. We look to Berlin's foundation, its experience during the Thirty Years' War, a conflict across German states that killed around 8 million, how it changed under the Hohenzollern kings, including Frederick the Great, and then under the Napoleonic occupation, before talking about Berlin's relationship with the Nazis, which you heard at the top there. Finally, we talk about Berlin as the bohemian city of David Bowie and other artists who found a home there in the 70s. I love Berlin and I can tell I have listeners there, so to you guys, this one's for you. If listeners have any suggestions for other city histories, do get in touch. I'm rather partial to Athens myself. Coming up, I've got the Year of Revolutions with Sir Christopher Clarke. The Film Club continues on Tuesday with Margin Call on the 15th anniversary of the financial crash. Please do rate and review if you can and share the pod with anyone interested. Until then, I'll hand you over to me talking with Barney White Spunner on the history of Berlin. Barney White Spunner, welcome back. It's fantastic to have you on again. And we are going to be talking about your book, Berlin, the story of a city, which... I was looking at the um, description from the publisher and Berlin is described by your publisher as Europe's most fascinating city, a fascinating, exciting city. So, I I mean, for the purposes of this podcast, that's exactly what it is. (laughs) But so I I wanted to just sort of kick things off. Berlin, Berlin is about a thousand years old. Is that right? Is that about right? Would you kind of know when it sort of when it began? Yeah, well, thanks very much. And um, it's wonderful to talk about Berlin. Um, I mean, Berlin's been there as a settlement, as fishing villages. So since time immemorial, they we found Wendish remains and that on what is now Museum Island. But rarely, the, it rarely comes to preeminence in about 1415, when the Hohenzollerns make it their capital. Actually, Berlin takes its actual birthday from 1273. For That's the first time its name is recorded on a document. But it's it's rarely with the coming of the Hohenzollerns, who, uh, when they buy the Mark of Brandenburg from Emperor Sigismund, who is bust, as Holy Roman Emperors always were, for 400 gold marks, or they move up Brandenburg and sort of looking for where to put their capital. And initially they look at other sites, but they then realise that what is then a fairly thriving commercial settlement that's developed around the twin f- fishing villages of Berlin and Köln, around the island on the River Spray, is really the ideal place. And they start to build their fortress, the Zwingberg, which is exactly on the site of um, what becomes the, the the sort of a Schloss, Berlin, Berliner Schloss, and is now exactly the site of the Humboldt Forum. So it's really from then that it sort of comes to, to preeminence. But Berlin remains quite a sort of small city in European terms, right up until the 17th century. So during the 1400s, 1500s, it's really quite provincial, and it's thought to be as such by the more developed German states, particularly the Saxons. There's always this rivalry between Saxony and Brandenburg, between Dresden and Berlin, uh, as to um, uh, as to which is sort of the lead city. But that doesn't mean there was an awful lot going on there. And part of the reason I wanted to start this book then with the, with the beginnings of Berlin is because so many of the trends, so many of the things that happen afterwards have their roots in those two centuries. And there's a real tendency, I, I find, in books of German history in general and Berlin history in particular, to immediately sort of focus on the last few centuries 
maybe from Frederick the Great onwards. But I think by doing so, you miss out on that hugely interesting and terribly important bit, which is when uh, many of the movements, trends, characteristics start. Yes, well, that's absolutely right. Because as I was looking through it, through the book, the, I mean, particularly the period around uh, you have the great elector, Frederick William I. Yeah. And then, of course, the Thirty Years' War. I mean, Berlin is 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 hugely affected by that, isn't it? Yeah, t- hugely. I mean, I it's, um, I think the Thirty Years' War still has an impact on Germany today. I think the Thirty Years' War was such a cataclysmic event, and it's something that we slightly neglect, particularly in English schools, because we're always asked, "Was it a war of religion?" But actually, what it on that it, exam just, just for the benefit of listeners it's is that is it you're gonna if i get this wrong 1648 right so it starts with the wonderfully named defenestration of prague when the Habsburgs ambassadors are, are thrown out of the window in in prague and ends with the treaty of westphalia and for the first 10 years between about 1618 and 1628 berlin and brandenburg aren't really that affected by it but from 1628 for the Right up to the early 1640s, Brandenburg is absolutely crucified by marauding armies, imperial and and, and Protestant, by the particularly by the Swedes. And this thriving commercial centre that's sort of developing cultural movements, that's developing artistic talent, talent that's done very well trading, and people are really proud of. You know, they've got a really good life going. There's an utter desecration that comes from the Thirty Years' War. And it's beyond people's comprehension. They can't sort of understand why it's happened. And Berlin is reduced to, well, under 5,000 people. I mean, about 2,000 houses. It's a cut in literally. There's about half of it left. What was the population before? Population varies, but roughly 15,000, 20,000, if you, depending on how many of the outlying areas you take in. But what people find so difficult is, well, what was all this for? I mean, it's actually, and they say, with some very bitter comments, you know, this is a war to enrich soldiers. It's a war for the vanity of, of dukes. It's a war for the vanity of princes. If, if you look at pe- people writing in Germany af- in the, afterwards, if they always hark back to this. So Frederick the Great, who, okay, maybe no great author, but actually somebody whose opinion is obviously rather valuable, said that the Thirty Years War still dominated thinking in Germany during his reign, which is 100 years later. Schiller, the great Schiller, actually writes a treatise on the Thirty Years War, almost before he writes anything else, almost as if you can't sort of start writing German literature unless you understand how dreadful this has been. And it's not just Brandenburg, of course, it's much wider in Germany. It's obviously awful in the Palatinate and Bavaria as well. And then you look even at modern German writing, you know, you look at plays like Mother Courage. I mean, Mother Courage actually was a subtler in the Thirty Years War. So I think it is, I think you've got to, if you're looking at the history of Berlin, history of Germany, you can't just sort of gloss over that. And it has had such a huge impact. And then the great elector, so Frederick William I, who effectively is the, the Margrave of Brandenburg, but becomes also Duke of Prussia. They're very good marriers, the Hohenzollerns. They, they worked out the marriage, European royal marriage market quite well. And through some judicious marrying between him, his father and his grandfather, they effectively bring unite Prussia and Brandenburg or bring Brandenburg into Prussia as one, we can't say monarchy yet, but one as one country, if you like, which it will become a kingdom. And he is the most remarkable man. I mean, the Hohenzollerns actually the most remarkable dynasty. We badly need a, a biography of the Hohenzollerns all the way through. But Frederick William is not only sharp and incredibly efficient, but he's also visionary. So he rebuilds Berlin after the destruction of the Thirty Years' War. He surrounds it with these extraordinarily sophisticated ramparts on the sort of Vauban model, which were only last for 200 years. In fact, a lot of the funny zip and wiggles on the S-Bahn and the U-Bahn routes now are due because they have to go around the foundations of the great electors' fortifications. So beyond that and beyond building up and that in developing the first Prussian army, he realises that he's living in a Europe which is very intolerant. And as he's trying to get industry going, he sees Louis XIV revoking the Edict of Nantes. He sees this very talented French Huguenot community, of course, mostly were Calvinists rather than Lutheran, and he is, of course, a Calvinist. He invites them into Prussia, but he's not just sort of inviting them. 
I mean, he says, right, here's this community. We'll go and get them. So he sets up an embassy and almost sort of an immigration service in Paris, much what Europe d- does now with, you know, falls far short of what he managed to do. So the Huguenots are sort of told to go to Paris. They're given passports. They're given money. They're coming to Berlin or wherever, not all to Berlin, but not a lot to Berlin, where they're given uh, houses or land. And by the end of his reign, Berlin is 25% French. But at the same time, he's doing the same thing with the Jewish population from Vienna. And the Habsburgs are going through one of their sort of periodic sort of Catholic naval gazing sessions they went through. And there's a, two Jewish pogroms in Vienna during his reign. And again, he extends friendship to the Jews. He gets leaders of a Jewish community in Vienna to, to come and be he interviews in Berlin, sets out the terms to them. And or there's always been actually a flourishing Jewish population in Berlin. And Berlin's always been, not totally, I'm afraid to say, but it's always been much more tolerant. There's always been much more emancipation of a Jewish population than in some European cities. So I'd love to say that after the great elector, you know, there is no more so anti-Jewish movements, but that's not true, of course, and then of course we have a tragedy of the Second World War, which is a cataclysmic one. But um, so what you have to Berlin by the end of, uh, let's say, by roughly seven, roughly 1700, um, by the time the great elector dies and his son, Frederick I, takes over, you have got a city that's pretty well rebuilt. It's adequately defended, both by physically and with an army. And it has got a flourishing uh, industrial base in the way that industries were then. So we're obviously way before the Industrial Revolution. So we're talking about cloth, porcelain, metalworking, which means that by 1700, you've only got a flourishing city. So when Frederick first, his son takes over, he is able, if you like, to consolidate what his father's done. He's able to say, look, you know, we've got the country back on its feet. We are now Prussia, a country. Uh, we're not just the little mark of Brandenburg. And Barney, Prussia is actually a pretty big landmass, isn't it? I mean, it's not just a small city state. You know, people forget that Prussia wasn't just the sort of swamps and forests beyond Pomerania that stretched off towards the Russian border. It is, of course, the area in the west of Germany. Ulick cleaves a bit. There's now the Ruhrgebiet. Bielefeld, these areas right up to the Rhine were all part of Prussia. So Brandenburg like, had been surrounded by Prussia. It's now united. So if you look at a map of Prussia, it's, it's vast, isn't it? Really? It's stretching right across North Germany, coming second in area only to, 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 to the Habsburgs. So Frederick I is then able to say, right, what we now need is a royal capital for this country. Uh, we will make Berlin into a royal capital. He becomes the king. Uh, he makes himself a king through a slightly dodgy deal with the emperor by providing troops for the war of Spanish succession. So the poor old troops have a fairly rough time, but Frederick is allowed to call himself king in Prussia uh, rather than of Prussia because of uh, rise with the Duke, the Prussian royals. He starts to build Berlin up. So where we've had the gloomy old Zwingberg Palace on the island, which I mentioned, that is beautified by Schluter and becomes a, a massive royal palace. And he builds Charlottenburg, the famous Charlottenburg, for Sophie Charlotte, his wife, who's a wonderful woman, described as the most wonderful princess, but sadly rather plump, which is another unkind of a woman. But it's her who actually starts to develop the sort of salon idea in Berlin. And she starts to rarely develop music. She develops the theatre, writing. She sort of gathers at Charlottenburg a, a group of artists and authors around her. And although Frederick I actually treats him pretty awfully, he has endless mistresses. And actually, I mean, some of his attempts to sort of set up the Prussian royal sort of establishment are, are quite hysterical. I, I write about them quite a lot in the book. They're, they're so funny. They're, um, everything goes wrong at his coronation. It could possibly go wrong. <laughs> so you've had the great elector who's got the thing back in his feet, Frederick I, who's sort of made it royal. And then you have these two extraordinary kings, one after the other. Frederick William the First as a king, rather than you know, as a Frederick the Great Elector was an elector, not a king. Who is the most extraordinary man? I studied him at A level. He's I wouldn't want him as a father. Well, you probably wouldn't actually, for enough. And he was pretty horrible to Frederick the Great, and um, pretty horrible to to his daughter, who said that in in Berlin she only had to suffer the torments of purgatory, but at Wusterhausen where he actually lived. She had to suffer the terrors of hell. But he is, again, he didn't live in Berlin. He did do a huge amount, again, for the Prussian economy and for Berlin. 
And of course, because he was such a bizarre character, and as you say correctly say, we wouldn't have him much as a father. His actual real achievements as king of Prussia get forgotten. And everybody, you know, has written to the nines about Frederick the Great. I mean, Frederick the Great must be one of the most biographed kings in Europe. But very few people have written about about Frederick William. Is it a sort of Philip of Macedon, Alexander the Great type, where he ref- Frederick William reforms the army to enable? Yes, Frederick- I think that's it's a very good analogy that actually. I mean, because it really is. It is Frederick William who does reform the army. I mean, he leaves Frederick the Great an army of about eighty thousand soldiers and paid for. I mean, he doesn't leave a massive debt. He does a huge amount for the armaments industry which is, you know, some people nowadays would say it's a bad thing. Well, actually, then it was a thoroughly good thing. It had to be done. And, of course, it employed a huge number of people in Berlin. He uses military contracts to get the cloth industry developed. He also, But he also has a huge amount of building. So he, it's him who really starts developing Potsdam, although he lives at Königsusterhausen. He builds a hunting lodge at Potsdam, which Frederick the Great will take, take on and turn into Sanssouci. He's responsible for the, for the first Berlin Wall. So this is known as the Customs War, and it's a wall that effectively surrounded Berlin so they could attack goods coming in and out. And the famous gates in Berlin now, like the Brandenburg Gate, you know, are actually the gates, but not that actual structure, that structure comes out later, but the actual gateway was, uh, they refer to gates on that wall. So as you go round Berlin now, all the various tours that you, you see are actually um, customs wall gates. The uh, cynics would say he actually built the wall to stop his soldiers deserting so he could keep them in, and there may be some truth in that. But effectively, it was a customs wall. Kuning Sisterhausen, if you go to Berlin, is the most extraordinary place. I mean, it's amazing that it survived because it was on one of Konyev's approach uh, routes in 1945, and the Russians came straight through the village, but luckily there was no resistance there, so we just went through it and kept going. But the house has got the original furniture and paintings in it. So you can go up and sit in the Tabacalegium room. And you can imagine all of them sitting there smoking their pipes. The poor old Austrian ambassador who hated smoking had to pretend to smoke. He had to sit there with a sort of <laughs> empty pipe in his mouth, pretending to smoke it. Because if he didn't join in, he wouldn't be taken seriously. <laughs> Wonderful. So, um, and then Frederick the Great, when he inher- in- inherits... First part of Frederick the Great's reign is basically spent consolidating, expanding Prussia um, in, in the endless wars with the Habsburgs, taking over Silesia. But in terms of his relationship with Berlin, he doesn't like Berlin at all. Frederick the Great doesn't rarely do German. He does French in Germany, and he sees France as a cultural model, hence his relationship with Voltaire, the music with opera, and the French language. But he also sees it's a governmental model. I mean, he's very influenced by Louis XIV, who was obviously long dead by that stage. But Louis XV is you know, still, if you like, continuing the same pattern of government at Versailles. And although Sans Souci and what he creates about Sam is, is not a Versailles at all, it's absolutely the opposite. It's a, a small, informal, completely charming, it is the most wonderful th- place to visit. But the point is, it's outside Berlin, it's French. And while he is fighting his wars and developing his system of government and his little sort of coterie of of Frenchness, if you like, at Potsdam, Berlin is beginning to become the centre of the German Enlightenment. It's beginning to become a definitely German city as opposed to just a Prussian Brandenburg city. And that's really very important because of what will happen in the future. So. Frederick the Great can't detest the German language. He says it's illogical. He, went, he, he speaks it, obviously, because of the army, but although his language of command, the army is French. He thinks German literature is insignificant. Uh, German music is sort of barbaric. But while he's thinking that, we have this extraordinary, what the Germans call Aufklärung. It's sort of Aufklärung means lots of different things in Germany, but effectively it's the exploration. It's a renaissance, if you like, in Germanness. But you know, at the beginning of the 19th century, if it was going to be a German empire, it was going to be a Germany as opposed to a set of states. I think most people would have told you the capital of that would have been in Vienna. I don't think many people would have told you it was going to be in Berlin. 
before we get to get to Napoleon's invasion, I was just interested yeah. about the culture of the city. Is it now developing into a one that we would maybe recognize as, if not German, then certainly a sort of a um, a, a Berlin characteristic? Yeah, I, no, I mean, absolutely. Because all the immigrants. Definitely. And... Yeah, it's definitely becoming German. So in, if we look at some of the, the people writing and, and practicing, you know, we look at the Lessings, um, we, look, we look at the, the Nikolais, we look at, um, well, maybe the, we look at the at, at Shadow and Quadriga, you look at the Brandenburg Gate and Langens who, who developed it. And then uh, you look mainly perhaps at Schinkel, maybe the greatest sort of German Enlightenment or the greatest exponent of a German Enlightenment. And he's the most extraordinary man, Schinkel. I mean, he not only, he starts off designing theatre sets, but he designs furniture, he paints, and he designed the first Iron Cross, which is the Iron Cross was, was instituted to reward people for assistance to the French. Really? Which, which is often conveniently forgotten in sort of 19th and 20th century German history. Yeah. And the, the first one was given to the Queen, Queen Louise. Schinkel's re- really well known for his architecture. And if one man has had an influence on if you like what I would call the German Enlightenment, the German architectural style, and on Berlin, it's going to be Schinkel. And as as we move into the, the Napoleonic Wars, I guess this, this is where, it's, well, they're effectively under occupation, aren't they? Yeah, and it's a pretty nasty occupation. If you look to what Napoleon did to Prussia, two things stand out. One, it's politically, I think, extraordinarily short-sighted. But secondly, it's also brutal. So he effectively cuts Prussia's population in half and he drags the Kaiser, who takes his small son, who will end up being Kaiser Wilhelm I, and he makes the the king and his son and Queen Louise stand on the bank of the river Niemann while he and Bazaar carve up Prussia on their barge and tilts it. It's extraordinary because that is small boy who stands on the riverbank is the same man who will eventually stand in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles and declare the German Empire over the the, the bones of of the French Republic. It's extraordinarily... Is this the beginning of a French-Prussian rivalry then? Yes, I think it is. French-German. What's so interesting about that is I don't think it had really been there that much before. I mean, obviously, the Thirty Years' War, the, the the French became involved, but actually, the French troops didn't get in Thirty Years' War. Didn't sort of go up quite so much into North Germany and Brandenburg. You know, they're more focused on the Rhine. But I think Napoleon is respond. Yes, I think you're spot on. I think he is responsible for this for this antipathy that you know, will go right on then up for for 150 years. But it, it's it's so short sighted. Because Napoleon couldn't have possibly thought it was ever going to last. I mean, and one of the interesting side effects of it is the creation of a King's German Legion. So many Prussians who were just so infuriated by French arrogance um, leave Prussia and come and form regiments in the British Army. And the King's German Legion will fight uh, very successfully under Wellington in Spain and then very particularly successfully at Waterloo. Berlin itself, it's very arrogant. And there's a real resistance against it. So that so girls who go out with French officers are um, not quite tarred and feather, but they're completely sort of sidelined. You know, people who invite French officers into their house are, are ostracized. And eventually, you know, the French are comprehensively defeated, but it's with many casualties. And uh, that, of course, is the the other thing which is so important about the expulsion of the French is that it's because the Prussian army has been largely taken over by the French or disbanded, it is the it is the Landwehr, it is the, the the volunteer forces, the volunteer army that takes a huge amount of the credit, justifiably for having got rid of Napoleon. And that's where the colours of a German flag from today come from. The the red, gold, and black comes from the the um, Landwehr uniform. But the idea that German culture is rooted in a deeper, older sort of fresher, cleaner Germany. It, and say so you have the Wanderlust, the Wanderlust movement, uh, with, with uh, walking, getting out into the countryside, the idea of rediscovery of German values, and the idea that it's these German values that have allowed you to get together and defeat Napoleon. And what's important is they will be perverted. 
but later by the Nazis into Nazi culture. So sort of revoltingly exemplified by people like Goebbels and, and Himmler. That's why Nazism is clever, however nasty it is, because it actually is seen to articulate uh, a lot of these feelings and a lot of these values, a lot of this idea of Germanness that harks back to uh, getting rid of Napoleon. And then Berlin during the, the 19th century, um, I mean, you get the development, obviously, the unification of Germany. Um, and uh, it's interesting to hear how Berlin, because that's when Berlin becomes... Because Königsberg is the capital of Prussia. Yeah, yeah. And, well, it's the capital of Prussia until Frederick I. Königsberg and Prussia is Lutheran. The Hohenzollerns are Calvinist. They, there is a very strong anti-Calvinist feeling in Königsberg. I mean, so much so they refuse to let the great elector remove his father's body for burial um, for quite some time because they say they're not going to have a Calvinist, <laughs> Calvinist service. They are very mean with money. So actually, it's not. And also, they're in the wrong place for this new kingdom of Prussia, because go back to what I was saying before, you know, this now stretches from the Rhine through to the, you know, the almost of what we call the Russian border. Königsberg is East Prussia, which is now part of Russia. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, well, yeah, it is. It's Kaliningrad. I mean, yeah. So, you, you, you know, actually, Berlin is central to that. Berlin isn't actually central to modern Germany at all. Berlin's right to the east of modern Germany. But actually, to old Prussia, Berlin is in the middle and Königsberg wasn't. So it's not an attractive place for the Hohenzollerns. And then, and then so with, during, the, during the 19th century, we get unification of, of Germany and Berlin yeah. is, is the capital. Yeah, and that has a big impact. And um, it really, it, 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 two things to comment on with that. First is that it makes Berlin the financial centre of Germany, which it hasn't been up until then. And that has a huge impact. It means that the government institutions that were previously just Prussian, now the German institutions are going to be in Berlin, and the Reichstag is is built, that great building, hugely difficult. Uh, we always tease the Berliners, but they shouldn't worry. It's taken them so long to get their new airport functional. It took it, it took about 15 years to get the Reichstag built. The other reason Berlin is so preeminent is that it has become the the biggest city in Europe, one of the biggest cities, fastest growing city in the world, due to the Industrial Revolution. But during the 1830s and 40s and 50s, you know, the Industrial Revolution rarely takes off. So most German, most houses in Berlin have electricity before they have running water. I mean, it's, um, so, but what, of course, it does create is a, is a huge underclass, no different to any other city in Europe. And yet, because Berlin's expanded so fast, the underclass is less well provided for. They, they sort it out. By the end of the 19th century, Berlin actually has decent hospitals, decent education, and it boils over as in 1848 with the revolution. And it will, interestingly, make Berlin increasingly socialist. So by the time you get to 1914, Berlin's about three quarters socialist. More in the centre, fun enough, but on the outskirts. The outskirts of Berlin tend to be more right wing, more wireless, and actually, interestingly, later more Nazi. Uh, but the centre of Berlin is pretty solidly left, and it will remain left right up you know, under the Nazis as well. Well, I just wanted to explore that during the Nazi period because it's known as the less enthusiastic about Nazism. But I just uh, you've 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 mentioned which parts of the city are more keen on the Nazis than than not. It would just be interesting to to um, just explore that a little bit further. Yeah, no, certainly. Well. In 1918, Berlin effectively revolts against, well, the Kaiser's, by November, the Kaiser's gone. Berlin is, there is a revolution against, let's say, the various interim governments. It, it is a socialist city. Those revolutions are put down in a bloody way by what's left of a German army, the Freikorps, uh, but basically formed units. And so in the 1920s, you have this standoff between socialist Berlin, many of the leaders of whom we'll, we will see again in 1945, men like Ulbricht. You have a, a, a socialist tradition, which is, is very strong. And many socialists uh, would actually 
say that it is actually, but it, it's a revolution that that should have been successful. They sort of see it as, if you like, the first, in the terms of Marxist development, that was the uh, the first stages of it, and they therefore saw the transfer of power to East Germany to you know, to the Soviet system after the Second World War was the logical next stage of that. And of course, the Nazis and the right take a totally opposite view. But during Berlin, during the end of the 1920s, as the Nazis are beginning to come to power, and of course, the Nazis don't start in Berlin. You know, they start in the south of Germany, move up there. But you have a, a series of really vicious street battles going on between the socialists and the Nazis. And you probably know from Christopher Isherwood's sort of great novels, you know, where he writes about them actually so movingly. But it means that when the Nazis seized power, through the Enabling Act of 1933, after the election, they are pretty anti-Berlin and Berliners. The Berlins only voted about 30% roughly of Berlin votes in favour of Hitler in the 1933 election, which Hitler never forgives them for. Uh, And they do unforgivable things like not turn out in a sort of adoring crowds to clap him and cheer him. And you'll notice that the great rallies, great Nazi rallies, aren't in Berlin in the 1930s, they're in Nuremberg, because Nuremberg can be relied on to be a good South German Nazi-supporting crowds, uh, which Berlin can't. Uh, when Hitler invade, when the announcements made of invasion of Poland in 1939, you know, Hitler is infuriated that driving back to the Chancery, nobody turns out to chair, it's just the streets are deserted. Do, do you think uh, that lack of reaction influenced Hitler when he was so fatalistic by the end and was quite happy to see the German people being killed? Because the only German people he was really seeing much of were, were in Berlin? Berlin. I think there might easily be something in that, yeah. I mean, he loathed the place, as did Goebbels, for enough, who was the guy like, he made Goebbels a guy lighter. And, of course, he and Speer had this great scheme to aggrandize Berlin. He said it's not a suitable city to be capital of a thousand-year Reich. And Germania was this design. Uh, you can see it. It's actually it was a modeler in the Berlin History Museum. Thank God they never built it. It was going to be a vast hall built at the end. And inside that hall on the dome was going to be carved the names of every German soldier killed in the First World War, except the Jewish soldiers killed in the First World War. It, it was on a sort of scale of vulgarity, you know, about a hundred out of a hundred in its ghastliness. And it, it would probably would have been actually, you know, taken forever to do. They probably thought they were going to do it by slave labour. There are some things that the Nazis built in Berlin which have endured and are successful. The Olympic Stadium, Hitler's bunker itself has gone. Now a Chinese takeaway on Wilhelmstrasse, uh, despite the fact that endless busloads of tourists traipse around trying to find it. Hitler was very rarely in Berlin. He only rarely came back to his Berlin bunker at the end. He was either in Bavaria in his eagle's nest, and he spent an awful lot of the war in a, particularly once the invasion of Russia started in um, in, in the Wolfslau in, in East Prussia. So he's never rarely there much anyway. And Goebbels is, is there as little as he possibly can be. And the German resistance is strong in Berlin, uh, which is you know, hugely to Berlin's credit. So what's so tragic, really, is that this city, which you know, loathes the Nazis probably more than any German city, is crucified by the war, by Hitler's war. It's crucified by our bombing, massa by night, Americans by day later on, but then, of course, by the Soviet invasion, which is incredibly bloody and destructive. I mean, it's not, that is not a clean, neat sort of seizure of a capital city. It is a, uh, with, with no attempt to do anything other than destroy the lair of the fascist beast and with no regard given to casualties on either side. I mean, the Russians lose hundreds of thousands, as, as I'm sure people know, um, in, in that operation. And so the poor old Berliners, and you know, terribly well covered in Anthony Beaver's book about the Second World War, and also in that book he edited called A Woman in Berlin, about which is a marvellous book. It's just, well, marvellous, it's terribly sad, but I mean, it is in, incredibly sort of emotive and interesting. The story of a young woman living in Berlin, she's lost her boyfriend in the Eastern Front on her own, and how the Russians treat her and how the population of Berlin react to you know, another brutal occupation. Moving into the Cold War then, Giles Melton joined the podcast to talk about the airlift and, and the immediate aftermath. So I just wanted to go a little bit 
beyond the immediate years after World War Two. Yeah. And and to when the the wall goes up, and then uh, so we're into the sixties and um, 60s and through to the seventies, yeah. yeah. And then I think you arrive in the eighties. Yeah, I, mean, I was there in the late seventies, early eighties. I was there. I remember it well. Uh, part of the reason I wrote the book because you know they had such an impact on me. The city. It's one of the various cities in Europe that it really does get, sort of emotionally get you. I mean you. You, they always say a typical Berliner is one who's just arrived at the railway station, but it's very true. You, as soon as once you step into the city, you are a Berliner, you're part of it. You're part of that feeling. But yeah, so I think the uh, 1670s and 70s are, they are an incredibly difficult time, fairly obviously, because of the war. They are a horrible time for East Berlin's, again, fairly obviously, not just because of the political repression, but also because materially they're beginning to fall behind the West and very obviously do, to doing so. It's... um. Not that easy for West Berlin either. And this idea that West Berlin is some sort of paradise, while East Berlin is an, on, 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 on the next stop hell, is is inaccurate. There is no doubt that you know, there are, is an, are a number of East Berliners who accept the regime, who feel they identify with what it's trying to do. Uh, they uh, don't necessarily look at the West and think, this is all tremendous. We wish we were like that. They actually slightly look down on the West and see it as shallow. Um, and that's not just swallowing you know, Soviet and Ulbricht and Henneke's propaganda. Yeah, there's obviously a bit of that. But it goes a bit deeper. So actually, when you get to 1989, there's about a quarter of East Berlin who really aren't at all keen on what's happening. But go back to the 60s and 70s in West Berlin. It's difficult for the West Berlin government to get people to commit uh, both in terms of their careers and in, you know, commercially, to a city which people still have considerable doubts about its future. Because if you're going to invest in Germany, you're going to get a factory going. Berlin was an industrial city till the Second World War. After the Second World War, it becomes a commercial a banking service city. Nobody's going to invest in industry there when you've got to get your goods out through the Soviet zone particularly when you've got the experience of Soviet airlift. And in the 60s and 70s, an awful lot of young people say, why do I want to make my career here? You know, we don't know what's going to happen. Look at the great economic success of West Germany with all its access to European and Western markets. We'll go there. And you get to the extent of the Bond government having to subsidise the Berlin government quite considerably. So money is given to to Berliners and, and tax rates and to actually actually stay there. Uh, and also, you know, you've got to almost completely replicate in Berlin a sort of set of institutions, most of which are in East Berlin. So not only has East Berlin got the sort of main government buildings, it's got the Schloss, it's got Museum Island, uh, it's got the Unter den Linden, it, it, it's got the old sort of heart of, of the capital, but it's also got the cultural heart of the capital. It's got the theatres and the operas. So West Berlin and the galleries. So West Berlin has got to replicate those. And it does so quite successfully, but it always has that slight feeling of being temporary. In many ways, it gives you an incredibly warm feeling. I remember going in as you cross from the zone, as we called it. So you came over the inner German border and went by train or car in, into the perimeter of West Berlin, and you cross from that grey, empty, dull, threatening atmosphere of East Germany into this bright, sort of almost like consumer heaven of, of West Berlin. But you never actually felt that you were going into something that was necessarily that deeply rooted, despite the extraordinarily you know, successful efforts of men like Reuter and Willy Brandt, you know, who were both the great mayors of West Berlin. And obviously, it's the same going into East Berlin, coming back, you cross Checkpoint Charlie, and you wander on East Berlin, and it's it, it, it's like sort of going into a sort of Scandinavian horror movie in many ways. I mean, it's endless sort of dark, empty buildings, people in in, in threadbare sort of coats shuffling on with their collars turned up, not looking at you. You know, the shops with sort of pyramids of cans of something or other, but, you know, that's all that's in the window. Yes, there are, because it's the showcase of a DDR, there's theatre, there are restaurants. But the whole place you know, has a, a threatening feeling about it. The buildings are still pockmarked with bullets at poles. Actually, they are even now. Of course, the West also 
it, it doesn't necessarily be young population don't necessarily go along with with what their government are doing. So you've got ex- very violent student demonstrations going on as well. And we're around the time the Bader Meinhof, aren't we? Yeah, the Bader Meinhof is, is operating exactly that. You have this sort of cultural bohemianism, if you like, taken to almost you know, to ex- extent far beyond. It's a far more liberal, if you like, um, some would say licentious society than Paris or London or anywhere. And we were chatting about Bowie and the living there. The great thing about Berlin is you know, it is the most unjudgmental city. You can almost do anything in, in, in Berlin, sort of providing it's legal. We're running out of time. So I just wanted to bring up one uh, one thing that makes German politicians a lot more conscious of Russia, the influence of Russia, than perhaps we in the in further Western Europe, um, in France, and certainly here in Britain, we well, I don't think we appreciate quite as much is how close Berlin is to the East, yeah, and and how that influences decision making in Germany, and we're we're quite damning against German politicians for some of the decisions or lack of decisions they've been making over Ukraine, and I just wondered if that's because of their proximity to. Russia. I, I think it's got to, it, it's got to be a huge part of it, hasn't it? And because where you are, you know, your geography is almost where you start your politics. And I think people do. I'm, you know, I've always thought of the two great German capitals, Vienna and Berlin. Now, Vienna, to me, has always got one eye towards the east and towards Turkey. Uh, well, it did have, and perhaps not so much now. But I mean, for years, Habsburgs always looking over their shoulder towards Turkey, and Berlin was always looking over its shoulder towards Russia. And I, I think that is absolutely true. And I think if you sit in London or Paris, you have a very different feel to the problems of the world. Now, I'm not saying Angela Merkel didn't make mistakes in her energy policy, and I'm a great Merkel fan, but you know, you can never imagine Bismarck allowing Germany to become completely dependent on Russian energy, can you? No. I mean, that's just sort of inconceivable. Whereas, yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely with you. I mean, I think there is a tendency sometimes among German politicians to sort of try and forget that. I think Merkel genuinely sort of believed that we were beyond Russia being a, a, a threat it, it's turned out to be. But your point is a very accurate one. And of course, what's interesting, too, is that a lot of German politicians didn't want the capital to go back to Berlin from Bonn after unification. Uh, And the vote in the Bundestag in Bonn was only narrowly carried because they said Berlin is a militaristic city. It was the home of Prussian militarism. It was the home of Nazi militarism, which, of course, Berliners sort of find laughable because Berlin, its capital of Prussia, it was the most un-Prussian city. It's a city of immigrants, as we've discussed. And it was the most anti-Nazi city in Germany. So part of this is the old sort of German divide, and they say it goes back to the bits of Germany that the Romans occupied and colonized. Adenauer always said that he could he couldn't whenever he crossed the the Elbe and went into Brandenburg and Pomerania, he had to put the blinds down on his railway carriage because it reminded him of Asia. There's a deeper divide in this. What I think Berlin's done terribly successfully lately since unification is to be a sort of model to which the rest of Germany can aspire. Because, okay, it sits to the East, and it therefore is very conscious of the pressures of the East. It's made immigration work in a way that many other German cities haven't so successfully. It's got that sort of cosmopolitan German, yes, capital of Germany, but actually a cultural hub and a multi-ethnic hub and a very tolerant society. And I think actually as a city, it's really now a city that sets an example to, to modern Germany. It's got huge problems. I mean, I I think the biggest problem in Berlin at the moment one is, is the price of property. And you could argue that with many other European cities. But in, in Berlin, it is becoming unaffordable. Germans are now, a lot of Germans, not just Germans, other Brits and, and others as well, have second homes in Berlin now. And that was always a sort of French-British tradition. The French always had a house in Paris, Brits had a house in London. That never didn't happen in Berlin. You had a house if you were working for the government, but otherwise you stayed in your, your it was much more regional. But now a lot of Germans have a flat in Berlin or a house in Berlin, and house prices are becoming you know, exorbitant. 
and beyond the reach of you know, the the immigrant population who have always come into the city. And I think that is a problem. But ge- generally, yeah, I, I do think it gives politics a different slant because of where it is. But I think it's quite a positive influence. I think it's a positive factor, but it does. Well, Barney, that's been fantastic. Thank you so much. The book, which I should have mentioned at the start, is our book of the month at the moment. So we'll uh, be promoting that over the next few weeks. And thank you very much for coming on to talk about the, it's this great city. a huge pleasure, Oliver. Thank you very much indeed. I much enjoy it. What author doesn't enjoy talking about his books? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Delighted to hear it. Thanks very much. Thanks so much for listening. I do hope that inspires some of you to visit. Plenty more content coming up, including Roman history, revolutionary springs in the 19th century. The film club will continue on Tuesday and much, much more. Until then, thank you and good night. (laughs) 